Karen, welcome. Um, and why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Right, thank you, Adam. Um, first and foremost, as you said, I'm Karen. I am actually a veteran myself. I served in the military as an army officer for um, 10 years. And then I left the service and I spent the next 15 years in the acute independent acute care sector managing hospitals and operation outpatients and diagnostic centers both here in the UK and in the Middle East and then I uh, decided I was going to retire and uh, move to my small holding in Snowdonia and um, lasted a year and then I um, was asked um, to told a little bit about Broughton House and some of the challenges it was facing and um, I actually said out that I was going to work here one day a week volunteering working with the senior team here and very quickly I took on the uh, role of CEO in October 2020 and uh, I've been here ever since. Wow wow and just so a bit, for a bit of transparency um, myself and my team we know Karen pretty well and her team as we work alongside them and I am doubly delighted to have Karen uh, with me today. So fabulous Karen so your uh, retirement was uh, ended uh, Snowdonia, lovely place. So anyway, you came to Broughton and tell me about uh, what we're going to be talking about today, which is making or turning around essentially a charity provider to make it commercially viable. Tell me what the situation was like when you arrived and what you said about to do. Right. As you stated earlier, Broughton House has been um, a a charity running since 1916, Mm. and it has always provided, from the beginning, provided uh, residential care. Originally, it was a convalescence home, and over the years, it it progressed into, ultimately, in terms of a, a care home. But... Early nine in 2016, something like that, the Board of Trustees realised it was already an old Victorian villa when they purchased it back in 1916. And actually, the building and the facilities were not really fit for purpose for the 21st century. So the board decided that actually, in terms of it wanted to build a new purpose-built facility, and it commenced that. It had part of the funding, not not all of the funding when it commenced and it believed it could actually the shortfall um, with its fundraising activities actually you know bridge that gap by the time the the, the build was finished but unfortunately a number of things happened including COVID which had a massive impact on fundraising as most people be aware and um, in terms of I I came to Broughton House where they were a year delayed into the build and that was only phase one there were two phases to the build the residents in terms of in the old care home the numbers had to over a number of years be reduced to 32 to so that we would have enough space for our residents to move into the new build in the phase one but um, in terms of so that we'd already reduced our numbers to most people know you know 32 residents not really financially sustainable but then going into COVID and by December 20 COVID hit the home and we were down we only had at one point 20 residents in the home so all of Mm. that going on in terms of with a build that at the time when I came in or the board had changed chairman had um, moved on the home manager had moved on and there hadn't been a CEO for six months so it was quite chaotic yes and so all the best laid plans of mice and men and the vision Mm. that the board had hadn't really had you know turned that into a a plan that could be effectively executed and that was so you were coming into it you know in varying degrees on all sorts of levels of what frankly was you know chaos Right, I see. And uh, what did the the finances look like? Well, at that point, the in in terms of we had run out of money, right? And it was with that we wouldn't have, you know, we were going to effectively there there was we would have closed had it not been for GMCA, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority, providing us with a loan, okay, that, which allowed us to continue to finish the build and right. actually. You know, and and they provided us with a a little bit of working capital to give me time to see if we could turn around, you know, our situation, our financial situation. And it is, you know, so that has been a real, real challenge. Well, you yeah. had all the other, the new build going on and all of that. Yeah, I see. So just remind remind us, when is it that you uh, kind of took, became CEO? So October 2020. October 2020. Okay. Yeah. 
Right. And, and by that stage, the GMCA had, had given us a, a, a small loan, yeah. but it wasn't enough. So we had to negotiate another loan and some working capital. Okay. And, and as I say, and that then bought us, that allowed us by the time to then sort of change the whole operating model here at Broughton House to, you know, so we could get to more on a, a sustainable model. Yeah, I see. And, and with that, I mean, his, mm. the old way the charity had operated had been very much in terms of they saw the charity is there to provide money as and when the care home needed to have funds to able be able to do its charitable work which was subsidizing the cost of care for veterans who may who were not able to afford you know an access care they were the mm. affordability to access care of the standard I see. All right. So what did you start to put in place and what was your plan? I think the first thing was actually being clear about what the cost of delivering care in this organisation was and actually what actually fees we would need, the care home would need to charge mm. in, in terms of that. And then in the other key thing was ensuring that where we did take residents on charity, actually said it was going to admit a resident where it would be responsible for their care costs, that those risks were managed because, for example, one resident who had been with Broughton House mm. under the care of the charity or under the financial responsibility of the charity had been with Broughton House for 30 years and I think it's it's got to look at how much what is the cost of care for each individual resident what is the demands of that over a period of time and you know actually managing that risk and understanding what the charity could afford before that it very much did not look at affordability it was more we're a charity we can't say no this is a deserving person we need to take them at any cost and that's mm. just not a sustainable model so it was just getting people to understand the realities and how if you were not going to put some fi financial risk management in actually we were going to position where we weren't able to care for anyone because right. we wouldn't be around yeah i see so that involves some hard conversations and some tell me a bit more about that kind of setting uh, you know parameters and new guidelines and new uh, kind of rules is that right tell me what you yes. have to do to start to change change things first we had to look at the number of veterans the charity was looking after yeah and actually say so actually we said we couldn't take on any new could continue to fund any new veterans it was also looking at there are you know a lot of veterans who do get a good pension and that and really mm. making the distinction between those who need support and those who could fund themselves and who wanted to be at Broughton House they could go to you know they could choose to go to any independent care home because yes. they had funding to be effectively self-funded right. but they wanted to come to Broughton House because of its veteran background the camaraderie and that was important to them in their life but also understanding that those who could afford pay the full fee did pay that and again we felt that very much in the veteran ethos that actually if you could afford those of your comrades who couldn't you paying the full fee was putting money in to allow those who maybe couldn't afford to become and share this amazing home with you. And that was yeah. something that actually for our board of trustees, people were really, I suppose, reticent about that, didn't know how that would be taken. Okay. But again, I think me coming from a veteran's background with putting a commercial head on, I knew that that was something that was something that you could put out there and it would be, it you know, it would, it would people would respond to that well. And they have done. And I think people feel, feel very comfortable about that. And it's actually quite a nice thing for people to know that I actually would be in any care home, I would be paying this fee, but I'm here in the home I want to be in with all my vet you know, my mm. my ex-military colleagues and, and living mm. at the values and ethos of the military. And I am supporting my comrade in arms. And yeah, that, that's yeah. a good message. Yeah, I see. All right. So this this change around in fees and how or rather how the criteria. So it's much more of a self, a, you know, private pay self funding model. Is that is that correct? I think it's uh, a very mixed model now. Yeah, so, right. um, you know, whereas before we were either local authority funded with the charity yeah. pay top up. And that was the predominant. Now we're much more of a mixed model that works 
mm -hmm. in terms of in creating the sustainability here. Yeah, I see. Great. A big shake up on fees and how you do that and the relationship between the charity funding and the and the self-pay and, and you said the mix you now have. How long did this kind of take to sort of get into place? Well, longer than we wanted. It is only in the last six months that we have begun to be at the care home to be operating, mm. you know, um, at a, with a positive contribution. Yes, yeah. So it's taken a while, but there have been a lot of, you know, in terms of the challenges of that the home actually wasn't completed fully. The 64 beds at care home did not come on till December 21. Okay. So January was yeah. the first time we could sort of expand beyond 32 beds so we had that to deal with and then embedding and commissioning for the home and, we, and again we didn't have a commissioning team when they started to build it was very much left to the builders there was no, no commissioning team which is high unusual I'd say in, uh, in my experience in building hospitals and I haven't had the yes. experience of commissioning a care home before but I think that whole I think that whole charity ethos of you know they had a vision and and they had really good intentions. And what their vision was, was, a, was great. That lack of experience, that you have to have a really good sound plan and you have to be looking at how you manage risk, how you mitigate some of the risks that could come into play. Mm. It was, it would, fingers crossed, it would be okay. And yeah. we've been here for 100 years and we've weathered all sorts of storms. So if we just keep our head down, you know, the storm would pass over. And it just didn't on this occasion. And therefore, it don't, did require a radical rethink. But I would yeah. say one of the things the board did acknowledge, and I think that took quite a lot, it acknowledged its failures and it decided it was going to turn itself round. The recommendations and, and, and some of the very difficult conversations we had, you know, I've had with the board, they have have only ever been supportive oh, and we couldn't have done it so although when I look at it a lot of the decisions in the beginning and at the, the situation the charity found itself in the board had to look to itself but it did do that and it recognized its failings and it did endeavor to to turn its and make those changes <clears throat> and supported me a hundred percent in terms yeah. of to effect those changes yeah I mean I imagine that makes a huge difference if you Absolutely. Well, you couldn't other, have done otherwise it, you couldn't have done it right yeah, yeah yeah that's interesting so and you talked about at the beginning so your occupancy was about 20 I think it's above was it 50 what is it in the moment 50 something we're actually at 60 which yeah, we're really 60, wow about. that's that's, that's that's incredible. That's that's uh, three times from where you were at. The tell me what what else you felt you implemented to help you become kind of more kind of commercially viable. Obviously, you've made you know, made terrific progress. But was there anything else that you felt was important? I think really for the staff. I mean, everybody in social care has huge challenges in terms of staffing, but we've, we've had the further chat. You now we moved from one care home and I, I think, you know, I, don't, I wasn't here. I arrived six weeks later, but because they had to move because the old building was going to right. be demolished and it was during COVID. So moved September 16th, 19, um, uh, 2020. And I think most people find this incredulous to say, the care team moved the residents and themselves and everything from the old care home to the new care home by themselves in 24 hours. Wow. Now that in itself has left legacy because any commissioning I have ever done is in terms of your commissioning team is checking on things, making sure the new processes and procedures and the policies and all of that is all done prior to that. They moved and, you know, we're going to do that on the hoof, so to speak. And that really, you know, so even by the six weeks I arrived later, you could see the stress and the strains of yeah, people bet. because they hadn't been trained in the, from an old building to a really, we've got a really modern building here. And just the technology, the stress from the staff of the technology getting to grips with that which was there supposedly to support them but in many without the training would actually potentially break them was a real challenge and so that you know and even to this day I don't think we've the the effects of that and that quick move which you know 
on the day it seemed wasn't that amazing but the legacy of that you know we still to today feel that and even last year we decided to do a whole induction for staff from the get-go you know those who've been with us where whether you were new or not to actually run through the whole induction again because they thought that was something that was missing and real challenge for staff who you know were trying to do their best but we as an organization had not delivered from them them to, to enable them to do their best and so that in the South has been a big operational challenge for us. My initial was on the, you know, the focus of the finances and the stability there. But internally, that's been, you know, quite stressful. And then if you compound that with the fact that, you know, we were a business that wasn't stable, we were growing resident numbers, and therefore you would grow staff numbers on an already quite unstable platform. So all credit to the staff that but I think it is we we got through it, rather than, you know, it was as it wasn't as good as it could be. And that's something that particularly that we are still really working on to make sure that we are there where we need to be in yeah. terms of supporting our staff to be the best that they can be for our yeah. residents. Yeah. And in terms of re recruiting care, care, your care team as, as you, your occupancy has increased, how was that for you? Did you have a particular strategy? Obviously, there's recruitment issues in, in the UK. So how, how did you, you handle all of that? like everybody else in social care it's a real challenge mm. and we're unfortunate at Broughton House that we're you know we're not on bus routes easily mm. we're in a position that actually uh, public transport we're not easily accessible mm. to public transport we're right you know on the left of us we've got the um uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary and to our right we've got Salford yeah. who obviously in terms of recruiting and um, so it is always a challenge um I think a lot of our recruitment is the people who come here they are very inspired by the residents they care for right and that is a real motivating factor in terms of us being able to recruit good staff we we recruit above um, the minimum wage we we work to in terms of the living mm -hmm. wage greater manchester's living wage i think for us though you know pensions uh we, we're not we can't compete with the nhs and that right. so so the people we do attract are really and um, we are motivated by the opportunity to care for the residents who are our veterans and their families and our residents you know, are actually, they do feel that they are supporting and are serving by looking after those who've served. And, yeah. and you know, I think that, that's something that we're very, very fortunate. That is what, you know, a, that has been maybe a difference to a care home down the road where we, you know, maybe had the edge on that in terms of who we are and who we look after. Yeah, got it, got it. And, uh, well, congratulations on everything you've achieved, Karen. So in, in terms of what you you've learned from this um any other providers listening who feel that what you're saying is kind of maybe relevant to them what kind of tips and learnings have you got from this uh from, from what you've you've achieved well i'd say first and foremost i uh, i feel i still am very junior in the social care sector mm. and, and and i think one of the things coming from acute care i feel some of us who worked a long time in acute care sort of really voided social care and we thought it was a little mm. bit as the cinderella service mm. coming into acute care i'd say i'd wanted to in terms of it from the charity side but to ensure that this home survives is really really important but i think i suppose in terms of what i think the biggest change is that that for us which is actually putting broughton house every every care home has massive challenges i think for to, to remain viable mm, mm. You, know, you know it doesn't need to be the charity but for us we have to be able to actually meet the operational challenges as per any other care home in in the country how what we do with our um our contribution and our any profits we make is we just use them in a different way but that was the main lesson I learned in terms of we have to be, you know, as competitive and as, you know, financially viable as any care home in the country. We couldn't use our charitable status right. to not be as efficient and as effective. Mm, yeah, I see. Great, great. You know, we, we've covered a lot, covered a lot here and uh, some great insights. And uh, just, uh, just to say again, congratulations, because it's a, a terrific home and uh, has this wonderful reputation um, and has been around for you know for a considerable 
period of time. So, so uh, double congratulations. Now, Karen, is there anything that you would like to share that you've not shared up to now that you feel would be useful? As I said, I think for me, it's it's more about being, I've had to, we've, you know, I've come in and I've actually had to learn from colleagues in the social care sector. Mm. And a number of, of, of the care home groups have been very supportive of Broughton House to share their expertise. We're a standalone facility. I think that's really important to say. So, mm. you know, our little head office, our charity head office is on site with our care home. And the other bigger providers um, have been very, generous and gracious to share with us some of their expertise to allow us to oh, that's be great. more commercially viable and that that mm. you know and in many ways we couldn't have done it without those people being willing to share some of the you know how you deliver in very challenging market and so it's more a case of what they you know it's what I've learned from the care sector not oh, what the care sector can learn from me is, is, yeah. is my message uh, and what what kind of uh what any does any particular recommendations come to mind? I think everybody, you know, so particularly on the operational front and in, in terms mm. of it's the key performance indicators. And, you know, we never had any of those here right. at Broughton House and how most organisations, you know, absolutely those key performance indicators, you know, are absolutely critical to ensure that you are a viable business and bringing things like that in, and then sharing in terms of what is considered benchmarking to allow sharing information to allow us to benchmark, whereas bigger organisations, if you've got four or five homes, 20 homes, you can benchmark. We don't have that. So where organisations have allowed us to share their statistics so we can have something to benchmark against has been really, really helpful. You know, it's been absolutely helpful and, 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 and has helped change our practice and drive better efficiency, better, you know, be, allow us to be more effective, which again enables us to, you know, to, to achieve that sustainability yeah that's great um and, and karen finally if anyone wants to get in touch and maybe just put your brains on on anything in particular how can they best get in touch with you they, my email or in terms of um brought in house um, the, the main telephone number that they will become they'll be switched into me great karen thank you so much for being on the ksco success stories podcast thank you